Okay, so for almost 50 years, <clears throat> Louise Weber was a mainstay of Parisian popular entertainment connected to some of the most enduring and iconic venues of the age. Much of what is known um, or described of Weber's life has been exaggerated. It must be admitted, though, by Weber herself at some time. Um, she never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And she played up to her public image as much as she fought against it. It's assumed now that Louise Weber was um, bisexual or she was possibly lesbian. We're not, it's, there is no consistency. However, in the past when this assumption was made, it was seen as further evidence of her otherness, but in a pejorative sense. She lived in an age where queerness in any sort was equated with badness, and even though this has been reclaimed, um, it's still, um, I argue, inaccurate. What I have found is that the thread of queerness in, and this actually sort of fits in quite neatly with um, what's already been said, the broader sense of non-conformity being in a sexual sense or social sense, um, is interwoven with other uh, presumptions about La Goulou based on the spaces that she inhabited, the company that she kept, her career, and ideas about sex during the fin de siècle. La Goulou was less debauched and more successful than is believed. She was a canny, if perhaps overgenerous, businesswoman whose fear of poverty drove her to remain abreast of popular entertainment trends and trade on her sexuality but in a less explicit manner than others by playing on her reputation as a queer and a sexually assertive, and putting those two things together, she was doubly dangerous for the time, character, she was able to turn her situation to her advantage. However, she did to an extent become trapped by her public image and the falsified aspects of, of this public persona are unfortunately what have survived. But so, to set the scene, La Goulou, Louise Weber, I should say, was born in clichy la garenne in 1866 to parents who had migrated from Alsace-Lorraine. As a child, Louise worked with her mother in the 18th district of Paris and as a teenager began frequenting dance halls in the area. She'd borrow the customers' clothes to wear out at night, eventually making the jump from gifted amateur to paid performer being given the stage name of La Goulou, which means the glutton. Her earliest appearance was when she was 16 in 1882, so by the time the Moulin Rouge opened in 18, October 1889, she was a well-established personality of the district. In 1895, she left the Moulin and opened a sideshow booth decorated with works by Toulouse-Lautrec. She moved from dancing to animal taming, joining the Pezon family troupe before setting up her own act and marrying a former stage music magician named José Troxler. In, a, in late 1895, she had a son who also joined the act as a barker while he was a child. But by 1919, La Goulou had sold most of her menagerie animals and in the 1920s appeared as a living relic of the fin de siècle at fun fairs, as well as taking on odd jobs as a street vendor and working as a maid in a brothel. Towards the end of her life, she lived in a caravan amongst the rag pickers in the slums of Paris and died in early 1929. Parallels were drawn early on in La Goulou's career with the narrative of Emile Zola's Nana, and indeed the details of Weber's life were forcibly redacted to more closely resemble the rise and fall of the performer turned courtesan. Interspersed with this are associations with prostitution, with queerness, with accusations of destructive and all-consuming sexuality and an ignominious decline. There are superficial similarities, but the difference between La Goulou and Nana is that La Goulou's exploits have been blown out of proportion, often as part of the publicity push to sell tickets or to capitalise on the thrill of the dance hall scene that she was a part of. In creating this public image, the popular press painted La Goulou as a fallen woman and reinforced the equating at the time of the dancer and the can, -can dancer and the Montmartreuse with negotiable virtue at the same time as, funnily enough, this was all going on in Paris, but overseas the can, -can dancer became emblematic of Paris and France as a whole overseas to the extent that there was a, an artwork of La Goulou in the foreground, Cancan -can dancer raising her leg and the Eiffel Tower in the background. So the Cancan -can was more emblematic, more recognisable than the Eiffel Tower at that stage. And also, fun fact, this poster up the top was when La Goulou came on a tour to England and she performed at the Shaftesbury Theatre, which is now a fire station. Um, it's not the one, it's not the current Shaftesbury Theatre. 
Weber did play into her representation as bawdy or extravagant, as with her apparent purchase of the Hotel de la Paiva on the Champs-Élysées and eccentricities like bringing a nanny goat on a leash to rehearsals at the Moulin. She exercised what agency she could in trying to direct her image, and when she got older she tried to represent herself as um, oops, a mother hen rather than a pitiable character. La Guru remained almost fiercely working class, and this remained a constant and integral part of her public persona, maybe like Barbara Windsor or Wendy Richard today. At times her, um, her class was cast in a negative light, and associations, real or fabricated, with the underbelly of Paris were exaggerated by the press. And the same thing actually also happened to Piaf early in her career, um, and also six degrees of separation. Piaf's grandmother, Aisha, used to be a belly dancer at the Moulin Rouge. So. Um, in 1886, Lagrou gave a deposition against two procuresses, and her presence was seen as laughable when she denounced these women and proclaimed her own virtue. This was compounded by other court cases in 1885, she and Gris d'Egou, whom we see on the left, her name meant, her stage name meant uh, sewer grate, gutter grate, because she had gaggy teeth. Um, in 1885, they were accused of moral corruption for their dancing, for which they were acquitted. And in 1893, Lagoulou sided with notorious conservatives of the age against four models from the Bal des Cazars, accused of public indecency. Lagoulou's presence in cases regarding decency or virtue were treated as risible not only because she was seen as so quintessentially Montmartre, but she was also famously bolshy. She heckled the Prince of Wales, she insulted the Grand Duke of Russia, she brawled in the street with another dancer, she swore at priests. Regarding La Goulou's sexuality, much of what has actually been said or written is euphemistic or suggestive without any explicit labelling. The main source for an apparent proof of Weber's queerness, and, the, and I think this is the only overt reference as well, is one incident recounted in Yvette Gilbert's autobiography, Chanson de ma vie. Uh, but beyond this, there is no explicit reference to Weber's sexuality aside from newspapers following her, um, they followed her affairs with men or rumours that she was seeing this prince or that duke, um, her marriage, her separation. The figures around La Goulou were caught up in similar rumours, with her sister Jeanne being confused with La Mont Fromage, um, and both women being identified, misidentified as La Goulou's lover. There's also a crossover. People said that her sister was also um, a dancer or whatever. There's a blurring of, of the two. And here we see two images depicting Jeanne. Um, and the one on the right is entitled La Goulou and her sister, but it's still, even with that title, it was identified by some as being a euphemism, so it was assumed that it was Lagoulou and her sister. Um, the queerness of Lagoulou is also something that's vehemently denied by, or was vehemently denied by her great-grandson and biographer, Michel Soué. He insists that she was neither queer nor a sex worker at all, but he paints her instead as an early ally of the queer community in Paris, such as it was at the time and that she was simply friends with sex workers. Now this much is definitely cor uh, corroborated by her own diaries and her own uh, correspondence, what remains of it. Suve deflects suggestions of uh, in any intimations about uh, Weber's personal life, implying instead that other dancers and other people around her were queer, such as uh, Teresa, who was a Café Corsair star at the time and an acquaintance of La Goulou. In terms of the people around her and the spaces that Lagoulou inhabited, there are recurring intersections between different forms of sexuality and class, and the representation of Louise Weber was embedded within these spaces. Montmartre, for instance, was not only becoming known for its bohemian atmosphere, but it was already a hub of Parisian prostitution, as well as being a district known for a nascent queer culture, often with these with ideas of sex, sexuality and entertainment all bleeding into each other. This, is, this overlap is clearest at a bar called the Rameau, the Dead Rat, uh, which was a bohemian artist hangout by day and what they would call a uh, brasserie à femme, a women's bar by night. Newspaper reports mention Lagoulou visiting the Rameau, uh, possibly alluding to her uh, sexuality rather than any kind of connection to uh, Parisian bohemia. And, 
the two smaller artworks down the bottom are uh, depicting the the Ramon and the the crowd that frequented it, and the other three artworks are of um, the Moulin Rouge. And then up the top, the woman in pink, we can see again. There's this whole idea of sex and spectacle and sexuality and and voyeurism and that sort of thing overlapping. Um, and in this artwork, again, we can see um, a bit of the bleeding. So this down the bottom, I don't know how well it's blown up, but in the foreground there's a woman who's kind of being watched, plus the woman on stage, plus we've got the elephant in the uh, garden which had an opium den and an Arabic nightclub, plus we've got the woman on the donkey, and this is sort of a double um, reference to the goings-on in dance halls of the period because there were donkey rides as an attraction but there are also stories of women soliciting from the backs of donkeys and the idea of the donkey as a lustful animal and all sorts of different things so it all kind of uh, combines but so we see um, Lagoulou and other dancers like Nini Patonlaire were assumed to be sexually available because also not just where they worked but they lived in areas like Breda which was a quarter <laughs> where courtesans lived and men kept their mistresses. Moreover, the fact that these women danced the can-can would have elicited a similar reaction. The Moulin Rouge's dancers were described as having a physical flexibility equal if not greater than their moral flexibility. And Nini's dance school in Breda was suspected of being as being a front for a brothel. <coughs> Beyond the class and the quartier of women like Lagoulou, the venues that they frequented prompted similar gossip with and without them. The Moulin was a place where sex was for sale and for consumption, and not only did women solicit in the hall and the garden, but voyeurism, as I said before, was one of the main attractions. So beyond the dancers and the other punters, there was the presence of um, what David Sweetman um, was, is quoted as saying, lesbianism was good for business, um, and it was encouraged by the management at the Moulin because it sort of enhanced the the frisson for bourgeois onlookers. And for, furthermore, Xavier Sagi and Adolf Willett, who uh, Willett did the larger work here and Sagi did the one of the woman in the pink in front of the show. Um, they, Sagi uh, completed a series about the women found soliciting in various venues and both of these men depicted uh, what went on or perhaps a, a glamorised version of what went on but certainly what um, was rumoured to go on and, and perhaps exam exaggerating a little bit but what was encouraged. Uh, within the Moulin, sex as spectacle was ever present but the fact that prostitutes and dancers shared spaces meant that they were indistinguishable. Some of the Cancan -can dancers' stage names allude to this rumoured availability and their working class backgrounds with double entendre in their name. So Lagoulou's name connotes gluttony but of a sort beyond food and drink. It's dancing, it's partying, it's sex, it's everything. And this voracious appetite that was reinforced by another dancer, Jane Avril, who described her as the pleasures of the flesh kind of a girl. Among the dancers, we have Camélia Tromplamor, Camélia the Death Dodger, whose name, Camélia was, uh, had a double meaning because it was also a slang term for prostitute, probably because of an it was an allusion to Alexandre Dumas' novel. We have Jeanne Bonichon, which means Jeanne Pretty Tits. Nini Pat en l'air, her name means legs in the air, but the slang that they use, pat, is like paws rather than legs, so it could suggest more than just uh, dance steps. La Mom Fromage, which mom meant kid or urchin, but it was also a term for prostitute. And Georgette La Vadrouille. Vadrouille comes from the verb to wander, which could refer to the flaneur of the period, and again, this whole idea of looking and seeing and being seen. Or it could be a reference to street walking, particularly since some saw the closest female approximation of the flaneur in the prostitute. Uh, and here we've got um, shoot up the top, shooting star in the middle, sunshine diagonally down, grasshopper, tempest, gris um, de on the side, and then the one up the top on the left is rigolette, which could be this one might be a double entendre as well. It's either to do with the, the verb to laugh or to joke, or it means like rivulet or ditch or channel, so there could be um, a bit of a, a joke of sorts going on there. 
Other performers have been identified as queer beyond Lagoulou and possibly La Mon Fromage. They've been identified as queer and possibly erroneously and possibly through conflation with each other. Their presence highlights the prominence of queer celebrities within the public public scene, uh, but also the readiness with which audiences assume that alterity in their careers uh, went hand in hand with sexual difference and transgressiveness. And these include um, Georgette La Macarona, uh, who danced with La Goulou, and the clown Chao Kao, often painted with Gabrielle, a woman who was believed to be her lover. Gabrielle also featured in Lautrec's works depicting the relationships between women in the brothels he frequented. And so um, we've got La Macarona um, dressed in en jockey, as they say, it, it, as it's called in French. She's also the one in the pinkish hat in the larger artwork. Mae Milton is the one with the green lit face and she was possibly the girlfriend of another woman that um, Lautrec knew. We've got La Goulou and La Mon Fromage in the background and then up the top is <coughs> Chao Kao and Gabrielle. Um, so, to return to La Goulou herself, she used this reputation mixing in these sort of circles and, and um, rumours about her private life to her advantage and she even made light of it in, in later years. So when she complained that jealous ex-lovers had poisoned her panthers, she was asked to clarify if they were male or female and she said they both did it. Um, she also reminisced about her escapades as a younger woman. She would tell stories about when she lost her virginity at 13 to an artilleryman and she'd say, oh, the soldiers, they bring you luck, and this kind of thing. But she did seem to self-censor. Um, often uh, in, in interviews and in writing, she was often sought out by journalists, particularly when they were sort of looking for reminiscences about the good old days. Um, but she would embellish stories without really divulging any intimate details about others. And she said to herself, she said to herself look, names don't matter to me. So she'd give all these tidbits uh, of, of gossip. But so, um, to wrap all of this up, queerness can be seen here as the refusal to conform to bourgeois morality rather than a strictly sort of sex or sexuality related context. And in that sense, Lugby was undeniably queer by challenging accepted forms of expression, particularly where sexuality or emotions were concerned, and often quite simply by being expressive and um, demonstrative, I suppose you can say. She formed part of an early generation of women whose sex lives were the subject of mass speculation and rumour, but she managed to wrest some control for herself and turn what was effectively a teenage persona, she was given this name when she was 16, I remember, a teenage persona into an iconic name, navigating the positive connotations with the negative and living on her own terms. This comes courtesy of Monty Python, um, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Will. Um, we've got some time for some questions. First, the next speaker, if you, if you want to should, do that. Should we take questions at the end? At the end. Well, well, how do you feel about that, Will? Do you, do you offer you some agency? Um, <laughs> I don't mind. Um, I'm easy in the nicest possible way. Um, <laughs> Yeah. It's your chair, your chair. Okay, uh, let's, 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 let's do a few questions now because there's always that sort of... Uh, uh, yes, otherwise you might forget something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyone want to come forward first with, uh, to ask with any particular thing that uh, struck them about the paper? Yeah, maybe we should have moved it to the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's scared them off the beat. Yeah. Oh, just, just say your name. So we're Hi, uh, Chris Mayles. Um Will, I was interested that um, throughout, the, throughout your presentation you didn't talk about the derivation of the name of the dance that they were famous for. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, could you say something about Concon? Yeah, so yeah. Concon as well has been suggested to be um, a kind of slang reference to female genitalia. Um, but it also it had a number of different names and, and sort of evolutions and so um, there was an earlier, slightly earlier form called the show, or another term for it called the show which meant uproar um, and so there we've got these different names for um, for the dance and the dance steps but yeah Kong Kong was a, a, a bit of a um, I suppose you can you know, sort of cheeky um, 
Uh, but then, uh, interestingly, it was also in France. It was called Le Franche Concon because of the because of Anglophilia. But um, there, it, part of it was also the the aura around the dance was the stories that women didn't wear knickers while they danced at all. That they would wear split knickers, and so then not only was it called the Concon, but then you know you might catch a glimpse and all of this kind of um, all of these suggestions. It, it was. Um, a, a lot of a lot of what was going on around it was um, was quite suggestive. So. It, you, you mentioned the you mentioned the split knickers and mm. um, sorry, being an 18th century specialist. As far as I can gather, uh, in the 18th century, all women wore split knickers because of the long dresses, and so in order to urinate, they would have to have somebody go under the dress. Well, uh, and I just you know, wonder whether whether this is a sort of 20th century. Construction. Yeah, well, I, I think this is the thing. It's it's a little. It's become a little bit like Chinese whispers. Um, but by the, I think, and, and again, some of this was kind of a, a carry on because the dance is a lot older than the eighties, eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. But by the time La Goulou was dancing it, um, it was a different kind of undergarment that they were wearing. But there is this persistent idea of sort of the split knickers but there was also um, there were stories about La Goulou's knickers that she would have um, a flower embroidered on the seat so she'd roll, one of the dance steps is actually you bend over and you pull your skirt over your head and you flash your drawers at the audience and the flower would unfurl um, but yeah the, the split thing and this is one of the things that I, I realised when I was looking it up and I sort of went well hang on what people are saying and what they would have worn sometimes don't quite tally up, um, but it, it was all I think part of the part of the mystique, but also the the generations of dancers. So you know the generation before like, probably would have worn the kind of split ones. I'm fascinated. So the dances are much earlier than 1880. It's older. It's a lot older. Yeah, I mean it did evolve, but um, the the dance came about maybe as early as the 1830s um, and it was initially actually only danced by men um, and then that, yeah, I don't know what sort of knickers they wore but... Um, Did they wear dresses? No, no, this was, but there was also this kind of carnivalesque side to it and so they had things like the Belle de Clodoche which is this kind of carnival feast of fools type of set up and, and things like the the um, there would be balls held at the the opera Garnier and that sort of thing, but gradually it did become da a dance that was famously danced by women, or there would be maybe a group of women and one man. So certainly um, in the 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 track post, hang on, I'll go back. Um, we've got here in the foreground Valentin de Desorce, so Valentin the Boneless would dance with La Goulou and, and they would also do things like the quadri which had a group of female dancers and the one male dancer um, but uh, yeah it, it, it's, it, it sort of changed bit by bit by bit by bit by bit but it also became um, a famous, it, it, was a, it was also very working class, it was something that was danced in the working class dance halls and in the ganguette on the fringes of the city and um, and because these were kind of rough and ready neighbourhoods, another, there was another association with prostitution that was where women would go to solicit but they would also kind of kick up their heels up and either working to supplement their income or that's where they would go after they'd sort of worked for, uh, done a 60 hour week and earned two francs for it and you know going to these, um, in these sort of um, neighbourhoods and these these places but then the, the Moulin Rouge is an interesting thing on that south and that note because they were taking what was working class packaging it and selling it to um, to the middle classes and it, where it is within the city is this nice tidy buffer zone between full on rough as guts go up the top of the hill you might get stabbed and the very poshed up kind of venues towards the centre of the city which is um, Gone off on a little bit of a rant, but in a nutshell, yes, it's older, and there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Really Excellent. Just, just one more, one more question before uh, we get to the next yeah, speaker. Oh, brilliant. Thanks. Um, yeah. Marion Duncan, University of Kent. Found that really fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering how atypical she was for that time period. Uh, atypical in what sense? So, like, a lot of the pictures seem to depict um, um, 
women doing similar sorts of behaviours and similar sorts of um, expressions. So why her? Is there something specific about her? Um, why have I picked her? Yeah. There is more that's known about her. There's more that's survived about her. Um, she, she, it's interesting that she's kind of, um, I think that again something is sort of built up around her that she was, she's commonly believed to have been the star, which wasn't really the case, but there's, there's more information about her because a lot of these other dancers, we don't know what their real names were. Um, to the extent that even in correspondence between um, the dancers and Zidler who ran the Moulin Rouge, they would sign using their stage names. They wouldn't use their actual names uh, at any point. And La Boudou in her diary, which I, I found the, the Archive du Moulin Rouge have, a, have copies of her diary, she didn't use their real names either. Um, so it's just been a little bit easier. And, and she's one that's been a recurring character, I think also because of Lautrec. Um, people assume that, I mean, there's this myth that she was nothing before he painted her and nothing after, but because she has been the subject of artworks that he did, rather than any of the other dancers, you know, they, they had the, the photos that I showed before or postcards and things like that, um, it's kind of less iconic, if you like, and there's less sort of weight behind it. So she's left a little bit more of a paper trail. Not much, but a bit more. Thanks, yes. And uh, yes, thank you, thanks once again.